I love Father's Day. It's the greatest day of the year. It was about 48 years ago, and I was pastoring a church in a foreign land called Fort Madison, Iowa. Carolyn came to my office and told me that she was pregnant with our first child. Now, today, couples always say, we're pregnant. I I don't get that. She was the one who went to the doctor. She was the one who had the growing belly. I'm getting mine now. She was the one that uh, got morning sickness that lasted all day. She was the one who went into labor and went into the delivery room. She was the one who had the baby. So I don't get this, we are pregnant deal. When she gave me the news, she said it was the first time that she had ever seen me cry. And to this day, I am overwhelmed and thrilled to be a father. And I want to wish all of our fathers a blessed day filled with all the wonder and joy of fatherhood. My message today is certainly for fathers, but not just fathers. It's really for every follower of Jesus and every person who would like to learn more about Jesus. Looking to John's gospel, the fifth chapter, John chapter 5 and verse 16 Jesus said, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him, and Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. When I preach, I like to come to the text with a a number of questions. And certainly, two of the most important are, what do we learn about God? And what do we learn about Jesus? Well, in John chapters 5 through 7, we learn a lot. We are given a lot of information and revelation about both God the Father and God the Son and their relationship with each other. So this Father's Day, I want to talk about our Father in heaven. It's a message that includes fathers, but excludes no one else. I suppose Jesus used the term Father to depict his relationship with God more than any other term. In John chapter 5, you find Jesus speaking of God his Father over a dozen times and nine times in John chapter 6. So there is a message here, a relationship here that is too obvious, too repeated, too important for us to miss. Jesus is God's Son, and God is Jesus' Father. Now, I've encapsulated this relationship of the Father and the Son in three statements. First of all, the Father sent His Son. Secondly, the Father is seen in His Son. And thirdly, the Father saves in His Son. Let's take a closer look. First of all, the Father sent His Son. Jesus didn't just show up out of nowhere, didn't just show up on His own, a disconnected drifter, aimlessly wandering throughout Galilee trying to find Himself. He didn't show up a self-proclaimed Messiah without credentials or credibility. No, sir, He knew who He was. He knew why He was. He knew He was sent on a mission, and He knew who sent Him. In John chapter 5, verse 36, Jesus said, The Father has sent me. John chapter 6, verse 29, The work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. In John chapter 6, verse 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. 
In John chapter 6, verse 57, the living Father sent me. And in John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus said, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. And don't forget that great passage in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus goes to his hometown and his home synagogue and announces to his home crowd, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. He is the sent one. And his mission will never be altered for personal pleasure, nor compromise to appease hostile enemies. He never lost sight of the fact that his Father has sent me. There is no determent, no detour, no deviation from that mission. When his enemies threaten him, the self-aware Jesus responded by saying, The Father has sent me. When he is lied against and vilified and called a demon and threatened with stones, the Father has sent me. When he is arrested and slapped, beaten, and nailed to a cross, the Father has sent me. In John chapter 4, verse 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, and finish it he will. No threat, no enemy, no political powers, no religious powers, no king, no devil will stop him from doing what he was sent to do. He was too cognizant of the fact the Father had sent him. He was too committed to the fact the Father had sent him to compromise fulfilling the mission for which he had been sent. So the Father sent his Son. Secondly, the Father is seen in his Son. A little later in the Gospel of John, John chapter 12 and verse 45, Jesus said, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. And a few chapters after that in John chapter 4, verse 14, verse 8, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus responded to Philip by saying, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So if you want to know about God, if you want to know what he's like, look at Jesus. Listen to his words. Study his actions. He came to show us the Father. He came to reveal who God is and what God is like. He and the Father are one. He and the Father are just alike. You know, when I visit uh, with our children or even have the opportunity to Skype or Zoom with our kids, there are striking moments in those exchanges when, when I catch a, a look or a glance of the eye or a smile or maybe even a smirk or a setting of the jaw in my son that looks familiar. It looks like what I see. When I look in the mirror, now I never tell him that because I don't want to give the kid an inferiority complex, but I find it endlessly amusing that there is a person on this planet that looks like me because he came from me because I am his father. I can see me in him. There are physical traits and personality traits that mark him as the son of his father. Now, you've never met my son, but you, you know enough about him now to, to pray for him. So whether he likes it or not, he carries my genes. 
He has some of my traits, just like I have some of my father's. Now, my daughter, too, but not as much as the son. When Jesus gave us the Sermon on the Mount and taught us about love and mercy, he was showing the Father to the world and speaking the Father's words. In fact, in that sermon, he said, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. When Jesus opened blind eyes and deaf ears and when he delivered the demon-possessed, And when he forgave sins and told sinners to go in peace, he was showing the Father, the Father's love. When Jesus died on the cross, forgiving and praying for those who had carried out his death, he was showing the heart of God, the Father. When he rebuked the hypocrites and drove out the money changers and turned away the rock throwers by his wisdom, he was showing the wisdom and righteousness of God. When he lifted up the downcast and preached good news to the poor and set the captives free, he was showing the might and mercy of God the Father. Oh, the Father sent him, and the Father was seen in him. And thirdly, the Father saves him in him let me ask you does this sound like jesus had saving people on his mind in john chapter 6 and verse 37 he said all that the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me i will never never drive them away For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Or just a few verses later in the same chapter, John chapter 6, verse 50, Jesus announces, but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever salvation is not a matter of uh, multiple choices not a matter of pick and choose it's not a matter of let's make a deal it's not a custom designed option if there were any if there were other options than jesus why do you think god would have sent jesus to suffer and die on the cross Jesus made it clear that all who rejected him were rejecting the Father. In John chapter 5, verse 23, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, primarily, those red letters in our gospel are directed from Jesus to the Jews. The Jews, the people among whom Jesus was born and lived and ministered for the most part. And in the Jewish mentality, they had had two big connections, two very important historical connections from the Old Testament. First of all, uh, they were connected with Moses. Moses was their man. Moses, who delivered Israel out of Egypt. Moses, who ascended Mount Sinai and came down with the tablets tucked under his arm. But Jesus had a thing or two to tell them about Moses and their supposed connection to Moses. They claimed to be disciples of Moses. They pointed to Moses as their defender. But Jesus made it clear that Moses actually was their accuser. In chapter 5 of 
In verse 45 in John's gospel, Jesus rebuked them by saying, Do you think I will accuse you before the Father? Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. In other words, if you were truly Moses' disciples, you would be my disciples, because Moses pointed you to me. And then there were their claims that Abraham was their father, and this was a big point of contention that Jesus had with the Jewish leaders. They were of the conviction that they were descendants of Abraham, and as such they were in. They were safe. They were good to go, good to go to heaven. While they were born into this thing, children of Abraham. But like Nicodemus, they will hear the painful truth from Jesus that that wasn't enough. You must be born again. But the Jews were of the opinion they had Moses, they had Abraham, they didn't need anything or anybody else. And here come Jesus, telling them that it wasn't Abraham. It was the one Abraham pointed to. It was the one who was before Abraham. It wasn't Moses who saw manna come down from heaven. It was Jesus who came down from heaven, who is the bread of life, and who is the way and the only way to heaven. And so here's the way that argument played out. And by the way, Jesus never lost an argument. He was never outsmarted or disarmed by logic or left speechless by superior reasoning. Every time his enemies came to set a trap for him, they ended up getting caught in their own trap. Jesus had taught that his teaching was truth and his teaching was freedom. And the Jewish leaders resisted and said, we don't need your truth and thank you very much, but we are already free. We are Abraham's descendants. Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if Abraham was your father, you would believe the things Abraham believed, and Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. And he saw it. He saw it prophetically, and he was glad. Abraham saw my day. Abraham saw my coming, and he was glad. He rejoiced in it. They said, how can you talk like that? How do you even know? You weren't there. You're not even 50 years old. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus used their two major connections, Moses and Abraham, to point them to him, as Moses and Abraham themselves had done. Well, upon hearing this, they picked up stones to try to stone him. But Jesus eluded their murderous intent. You know, some people say that Jesus Christ never claimed to be God. My friend, just read the Gospel of John. Of course, he claimed to be God over and over. He claimed to be the bread of heaven, the water of life, the door, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life. He even made the claim, no one comes to the Father but by me. So here's the story. He is the story. He's the story of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's the story of Moses and he's Abraham's story. He is Paul's story and Peter's story and John and Jude and James. He's the Christmas story, the Good Friday story, the Easter story, the coming again story. He is God, the Father's story. God has one thing to say to this world, and it's Jesus. The Father sent 
his son. The father is seen in his son. And the father saves in his son. And that's my story. And I'm sticking with it. Listen, friends. Do you know Jesus? Listen, fathers. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the one who said, My father and I are one? Do you know the one who said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father? As I was anticipating this service uh, today, and on my way here, in fact, I had some thoughts swirling around my head about my concluding thoughts from this conversation we've had today. And that is, you know, Jesus, Jesus answers so many questions. Jesus heals so many hurts. Jesus makes up for such lack. Jesus fixes so many problems. Jesus repairs so much that has been broken. And I hope you know him today. And if you don't know him today, the good news of the good news is that you can know him today. He is available to you and to me. He's only a prayer away. Can we look to him together in that prayer? Father, I thank you today for the incredible revelation of truth that has been presented to us in the Word of God, in specifically the Gospels, and even more specifically, this Gospel of John. This unveiling, unwrapping of the mystery, this presentation of Jesus to this world. I pray today for every father that they will know Jesus, they will walk in fellowship with Him, that Jesus Christ will be the Lord of their lives and the Lord of their families. I pray, Lord, that we will be submitted to You and Your Lordship to such an extent that Jesus-like character will be developed in our hearts and in our homes. And if there are those today that hear my voice that don't know this Jesus, that have a great gap fixed between them and Jesus. Lord, I pray that all that they've heard, all that's been external, would become an internal reality and a life-transforming reality. That the presence of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, will be made real to them. Blinders will be lifted and eyes will see and hearts will know. We ask these things in the name of our loving Savior. For His glory, amen.